What's up, everybody? You're listening to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast with your boys, Matt Wolf and Joe Fear. Check it. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Hustle and Flow Chart Podcast from evergreenprofits.com. My name is Matt Wolf. I'm here with my co-host and business partner, Joe Fear. Joe Fear. And it is our job. It is our mission with this podcast and our consulting and our blog and everything we do to show people that there's a better way in life. There's so many people, so many people that we know that are stuck in dead end jobs that they hate and we hear them bitch about it and complain and we have to sit there and try to hammer into their heads. Look, there are other paths in life. You don't have to work eight hours a day. You don't have to work 40 hours a week. You don't have to work for that two weeks of vacation every year. You can actually create time freedom. You can actually create income freedom. And it is our mission to bring people on this show or, you know, do duet episodes between me and Joe where we show you new avenues to go down, new ways to achieve this, new ways to accomplish this. And... I think we're starting to do a pretty damn good job with this mission, Heck and yeah. I couldn't be more more pumped about what we're trying to achieve here. And today, we've got another killer guest. This is actually one of my favorite episodes mm-hmm. we've recorded so far with a guy named Phil Town, and yep. Phil Town is a... Oh, he's pointing to I'm me. I'm pointing now. to you to like pick up where I left <laughs> I off. I gotcha. <laughs> I gotcha. Phil's amazing. I'm just going to say that. As a person, as an investor, just as a just a human being, super, very, very generous man. Um, great in person, great on this podcast. We had the pleasure of meeting him a couple months back at a mastermind in San Diego. He's a three times New York Times bestselling author. Three times New York Times bestselling author. Yes, true story. <laughs> uh, Long time investor, value investor, uh, massive student, and connected with uh, you know Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and and has a variety of books. Invested. This is the newest one that he actually co-authored with. Um, his daughter, which is a really cool tale. We'll get into it towards the end of the episode of why this is really important, why everyone listening right now, um, even if you have invested, but like if you're just thinking about it, you got to grab this book, Invested. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, there's so many takeaways. You're going to learn the four key things that, uh, that Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger use for every single investment they go into and it's not rocket science i was able to jot it down as we were listening to them and reference that the entire podcast so i would definitely recommend you doing the same obviously not if you're driving (laughs) but this uh this is gonna blow your mind yeah we're also gonna touch uh, on cryptocurrency and like his his philosophy on cryptocurrency we dive into the marijuana industry a little bit whether that's a good investment or not so lots of we cover a lot of ground here but the way phil explains it just makes it so easy and so accessible and before we dive in one last little mention that i want to say here is sure. if you are interested in consulting and learning more from us and being advised on your business so we can show you these better ways that we're talking about feel free to reach out go to evergreenprofits.com consulting there's a little application form it'll take you two minutes and we'll see if you're a good fit and we love chatting with people we love finding new angles new ways to look at your business but uh do that after the show because this is some good stuff and we want you to pay attention so let's go ahead and uh, dive in with phil town all right phil it is hey phil thanks so much for joining us today how you doing Really good, man. It's good to see you guys again. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah, we did a little quick uh, camera shot right before here. But uh, yeah, well, we met back in San Diego. Yeah, we met in San Diego. What, what's it been now? It's a couple months ago. Ish. At yeah, the, somewhere the there. The Speakeasy event. And we were you, you gave a little talk there. And we were just really blown away by the stuff you had to say. Because Joe and I, we, we both know we should be putting a little more time and focus into doing some investing type things. But we're just mm-hmm. not making the time yet so it's definitely a topic that we are hot on and that we want to learn more about so we're super excited to dive in and chat about this stuff today all right well let's do it yeah man well i guess for the folks who don't know you which they should uh what's the quick let's give them a you know a minute or so a little background of kind of where you came from and and where you're at now Okay, well, I was a river guide in the Grand Canyon, and uh, one of the people I was rowing down the river um, is an investor. And long story short, I nearly killed the guy in Crystal Rapids. Oh, geez. And didn't. And then he said, you saved my life. And I told him, yeah, I, t- I saved your life. That's exactly what I <laughs> We'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> leave it at that. And uh, he said, man, I really owe you, and um, I want to teach you to invest. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm a blue collar guy out of the army and, and I had no interest in making money. I had no interest in learning about investing and I didn't have any money anyway. Hmm. So I kind of, you know, just blew him off. And, but that winter I was, um, 
I was I had a teepee up in Flagstaff and I was freezing my butt off up there. And I remembered this guy lived in La Jolla, California. Oh mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> and it was November and flag is really cold in November. <laughs> so I called him up and said, Hey, I'd be interested in talking with you, if, you know, <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Can I come get warm? <laughs> and he said, yeah, come on down there. And, and so I spent two weeks with him. And at the end of that time, he had convinced me that I should apprentice to him and learn how to be an investor in the style of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, which had made this guy wealthy. Mm. So I got all caught up in it. And I, I worked for him for a year. And then I went on my own. And I started with about a 1000 bucks. And um, five years later, I had about a million and a half. Wow. And then I started just branching out from there and wrote a book about it and then started speaking about it. And next thing I know, I'm teaching other people how to do this thing. Uh, we started doing that with one class in, in uh, June 2009 was our first class we ever did. Mm -hmm. We did it in Singapore where my wife got arrested for having bullets in her luggage. Oh, my God. <laughs> that sounds like a fun story. It's <laughs> a whole nother story. <laughs> uh, but we started with that kind of inauspicious beginning and and now we teach um this year we'll teach over fifteen thousand people live wow how to do this style of investing so wow yeah it's and really I, kind of taken off taking a life of its own yeah so, yeah and i know that's what like a three-day kind of intensive or workshop event that way and you kind of tour that's right. it around that's right and yeah. you guys are coming right i that's i just saw the dates actually i was like oh this month okay i gotta be there yeah that's, there that's the is. plan so right. so what what's the if somebody wants to learn more about that where can they go to to find out and go to one of your events well unfortunately the events get filled up so fast that we don't spend any time really uh putting them out on the website or anything mm -hmm. so about the only thing you can do is go over to rule1investing.com and just kind of follow uh, follow the links to um, the next workshop. Cool. Yeah, and, and I, I was, that'll kind of tell you about it. I think I was clicking around, and it's on the about page. Last time I saw, so yeah. I mean, we really need some work on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice looking site. Doesn't matter though. You're doing good things either way. <laughs> Very so. cool. Well, can, can you sort of define what um, what the Buffett Buffett and Munger style of investing is compared to? You know, I, I I'm not even familiar with other styles of investing that well. So, what would what what would be a description of Buffett and Munger style investing? Well, let me start with this: what what everyone else does, hmm. mm -hmm. which is virtually ninety nine percent of the people managing money, um, and completely what's taught in every college, um, is something called modern portfolio theory, which basically says that the market is by and large rational that people operate in their own self-interest and they're not going to do something stupid like sell a stock worth $200 for $100. They're just not going to do that. And as a result, um, and because the market is, you know, comprised mostly of professionals who are managing money, as a result, the market prices everything right. In other words, the value of the business is the price that's on it. Hmm. And if you want to make, uh, if you want to try to beat the market, it's a fool's uh, game because if everything is priced properly, that means that it's always adjusting for whatever the latest news is. Mm -hmm. And it's a 50-50 bet, whether it's going to go up or down. In other words, the price is going to move up until it's a 50-50 bet that it could go back down. Or it's mm -hmm. going to move down to where it's a 50-50 bet, whether it's going to go up. So it's always adjusting to that 50-50 level, which means putting money in the stock market is just a roll of the, you know, basically like, it's like a random system, like, yeah. you, like a roulette wheel or something. And so the only way you can invest is to put your money into a broadly diversified index, exchange traded funds, broad mutual funds, um, diversify across everything because you don't know what's going to be good and what's going to be bad down the road. And everything is already priced in for everything that's anybody knows going to happen. And that's the only way to do it. And then you have to accept a reasonably low rate of return in exchange for the almost certain thing that's going to happen, which is if you stay in it long enough, you will make a lot of money. Hmm. And that is what's taught everywhere, you guys. That's modern portfolio theory. Everybody believes that the Securities Exchange Commission operates on that basis. Mm -hmm. Only problem is it's total bullshit. Mm -hmm. It absolutely isn't true. And the, it's just, it's been repeated so much and it has so many nice qualities to it um, that allow fund managers to have an excuse for why they don't beat the market. You know, they don't beat the market because you can't beat the market. It's right. that simple. All right. 
So here, here's Warren Buffett at, at a contrast. He and Charlie Munger have slaughtered the stock market for the last 50 years. Um, $10,000 invested in the stock market back when Buffett started would be worth about $400,000 today. And that same 10,000 invested with Buffett would be worth something like 200 million. Oh, man. It's just an insane thing that they've done. And what they've done is teach other people how to do this insane thing. And it turns out that it's simple. It doesn't mean it's easy, but it's simple. Mm -hmm. And it boils down to just four things. Number one, be sure you're capable of understanding the business that you're going to buy and only buy a few of them. Okay. You wanna, you're not going to buy a hundred things. You're going to buy 10. Mm -hmm. um, so be sure you understand it. Second, be sure that it has a quality that makes it durable. Like, like it can, competition is very difficult against this company for some reason. If it's a, a railroad, it's got railroad tracks. So you want to compete with my railroad? Mm. You got to put in railroad tracks, except you can't because of all the restrictions. So it's got some durable competitive advantage. Third, it's got people who run it who have integrity and talent. And that's one of the hardest things to find mm -hmm. is people with integrity <laughs> yeah. and talent. Um, often, you know, it, there's an old saying that if you, if you uh, are trying to hire somebody, you want want to you want to make sure that they're really talented, really driven, and really smart, and um, and you got to make you, you know hopefully they don't have two out of three of those. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> if they don't have integrity, right? If they don't have integrity and they're really smart, there could be a really big problem if they're highly driven. That's right. So um, you want you want people who have integrity and talent, and then you want to buy it on sale, which means you have to know what it's worth. And that's what they teach. They've been teaching that for 60 years. And people who learn that, including the handful of fund managers who operate in this way, have made absolute fortunes. I, I can literally say billions and billions of dollars. Wow. And so, you know, that's how I started off. And I'm not, I'm not a big investor and I didn't raise a lot of money and work with other people. So I'm, you know, only, I'm only a little bit rich, but I'm comfortable Sure. And I get to play polo a lot, you know? <laughs> I was going to say, I know you have a ranch. It's beautiful. You have horses. <laughs> yeah, we've got 42 horses. Oh, excuse me. We have 43 horses. We Ain't just it. had another one born uh, last night. Congratulations. Cool. <laughs> yeah, did, you, uh, did, you, did you assist the birth yourself? or? <laughs> you know, I sleep right through those things pretty much. <laughs> My wife goes and does it. And um, she tried calling me, and I slept through the phone call too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's good. But I love, I love them. I love them when they're finally done out yeah. of the oven. <laughs> well, those are no; those four points are massive. And just to kind of reiterate, yeah, is understanding the business, and, and you know, looking about what ten of them you said, not a yeah. not a boatload. Uh, the second thing, quality, something durable like a railroad or a brick and mortar. It sounds like that has some competitive advantage. Right. And uh, yeah, the third, integrity in the people, talent, and then uh, fourth, buy it on sale after knowing yep. it's worth as well. Yep. Yeah. And knowing what it's worth is really, man, it, it's so simple. We, we do it the same way that I would go look at the value of a house that mm -hmm. I wanted to buy. You know, not, I'm not going to look at the house and say, oh, well, I'm going to buy it and hope that somebody comes along and pays me a lot more. Right. I'm mm -hmm. not, I'm not going to flip that house kind of thing. I'm not that kind of an investor. Right. I'm much too conservative for that. <laughs> I'm much too scared of losing money. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this place and say, how much will that rent for right now? And typically, you know, if I'm looking at something like that, if there's a tenant in it, I'm going to find out what the rent is, what the expenses are, and I'm going to find out what I would put in my pocket at the end of the year, mm -hmm. right? After I pay the property taxes and everything. So that thing that I'm putting in my pocket, we call that owner earnings. Mm. And I want to buy that house. And you're going to laugh because you're in California. Yeah. <laughs> I want to buy that house at 10 times the money I'm going to get in the first year. Mm. So if I'm going to put $50,000, oh, that's pretty high. Let's say $30,000 goes in my pocket net after taxes, insurance, and property management and everything. Um, then I want to pay $300,000 for that house. Mm. And of course, you guys are living in a place where that's pretty much impossible. Right. <laughs> Get expand our horizons. I live, in a place, yeah. I live in a place where it's totally doable. Yeah. Out here in the in the east, you can like down south of Atlanta, yep. you can pick up homes. A lot of homes are available at what the real estate guys call a ten cap, right? Mm -hmm. Effectively, a ten percent yield, 
if you paid all cash for the for the house, you'd have a 10% yield um, day one. You'd be getting 10% on your money. Right. And then, of course, you're going to raise rents, and gradually that'll go up. Well, what we understand is that's a very, very good deal. If mm-hmm. you can pay all cash and get 10% on it right now, you know, you want to do those as long as it's a good house, right? Sure. A good neighborhood. Mm-hmm. Okay, we yeah. buy companies that same way. Got and the it. difference in with real estate and and us is that you're living in California, you're not going to find that deal. Mm-mm. But you can get that deal in the stock market all the time. Interesting. Okay. Because the market fluctuates. It's so much more violent and volatile than the real estate market because it has all of these big players on Wall Street who are trading every day. And and boy, when they get scared about something, they take all their money out and they run away. And they're on a real short-term leash about how long they have before they have to perform working at Goldman Sachs. You know, they got yeah. they got to lay it out there every day. And they're they are very, very volatile and emotional about what happens in the market. And as a result, unlike the real estate market, really good pieces of property go on sale all the time. Mm-hmm right? Makes because sense. something happens to that neighborhood, right? Something happens to Chipotle Mexican grill. People are puking in the, in the Chipotles. <laughs> and all of a sudden, everybody gets out of that neighborhood. They just run. And man, that baby goes on sale big time, even though they have no debt, even though they've, there's no long-term permanent problem right. that they can't overcome. And so that's a perfect example, because we stepped in and bought the heck out of that thing under $300 a share. And right now, it jumped up to 450. Wow. And this is within the last year. I remember so, you mentioning this at, at uh, the mastermind. Yeah, I yeah. think it had had it jumped up at that point. I think it was about to, or maybe it was starting to rise. I don't know. Starting to rise, yeah. yeah. That's, anyway, that's that, amazing. We, yeah, you knew the right worth. Right now in this market, it's harder to find those kind of things, but they still exist. You know, mm-hmm. we're looking at several of them every week. We try to buy a couple a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and this kind of a process I'm telling you guys, it, it can make you rich and it doesn't take very long once you learn it. It yeah. doesn't take very long to do it. It's I would say if you devoted one-tenth of your time to doing something like this, um, you would get really, really rich really, really fast. Wow. Okay. So starting from that point, what you just said, the one-tenth of your time, because I think that speaks perfectly to Matt and I <laughs> and probably everyone listening here. How would the what would the first step look like? So where should they be looking for these opportunities? You say stock market, but obviously it's violent. It's up and down. Is that something that's a little bit more hands on rather than let's get some houses, for instance? Well, if you wanted to, you could look for houses and there's Mm -hmm. there's really, really great opportunities in real estate all the time. But you have to be willing to manage that house. And Mm -hmm. we've got a friend of ours that's down the road who is really excited. Um, I think she took a class from a really good real estate guy and she went out and made 75 offers on houses. Oh my God. <laughs> and then she finally got one. And, and over the last year, she's got four and you know, they're, that's pretty much all the capital they have and they're borrowing money to do more. Right. So she did really well. Right. But somebody has to manage those houses. Mm-hmm. Somebody has to do the bidding somebody has to go find them. And to me, that's just not fun. So I love what I do. I love digging around in the stock market. So what I'm going to suggest is you start right where I, you know, I taught my daughter how to do this. She just, I said, look, just start where you are. Where do you spend money? What do you like to spend your money on? Mm. And she said, well, I love yoga. You know, I like to buy some cool yoga things. I like my car. I like this kind of clothing, Lululemon mm-hmm. stuff she wears all the time. Um, I really like shopping at Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. Um, so she names a bunch of things like this. And so we started going down this list of places where she regularly spends her money and identified Whole Foods as a public company back then, Lululemon yep. public company still. Um, her car is uh, was from Nissan mm-hmm. um, and she was looking at a Toy- Toyota. Both of those are public. Um, and it turned out there would, there were quite a number of companies that she was already very familiar with because she was choosing them. Mm. And then I taught her how to go deeper into it to see, does this company have the ability to be around for a long, long time? And that ability to be around for a long, long time in the future in real estate is called location, Mm -hmm. right? That's the, 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 the durable competitive advantage of a piece of real estate is that it's in a good location. It's a house in a good neighborhood with good schools and access to the the city. Mm -hmm. And, 
So that location thing is what's called a moat. That is, that is the thing that protects it from competition. And it's protected because they just don't make any more dirt that's there. <laughs> that's right. And that's, that's what's so nice about real estate. <laughs> but with companies, um, you have to find, you have to go a little deeper and look, what is this moat? What, it, what do they have that other companies don't have that are so hard to copy? And it turns out you, you might have to do a little reading to, to figure this out, but most of them are pretty simple. Most really good companies that are going to be around a long time have what's known as a brand moat. They are, you think about them rather than the generic sure. product. So I'm thinking about going and getting a Chipotle burrito, not just a burrito. I want a Chipotle burrito. I want a Coke that goes with it, or I want a Pepsi, or yeah. I don't drink that crap, so I have a monster. <laughs> right? right? Yeah, so, or the Lululemon I'm, pants, like like your, like your daughter. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, man, my daughters just want Lululemon. That's it. <laughs> and, and there's a reason for that. It's a high-quality product, right? right. So there's this thing called a brand and it's really powerful once you get a brand and it's very difficult to just like you have to work at destroying a brand. Yeah, you do. And so um, Whole Foods obviously has that and it's very protective and Chipotle has that. So you're looking for that thing and that's, that is where the work is. You're going to read some documents called 10Ks mm -hmm. that are produced by the company every year and tell all about it. Everything about it is in the 10K. Hmm. And then you're just going to keep digging and keep studying and look at who's the competition, just like you would before you buy your first house. You're really going to do some homework and make sure that the foundation is good. It's got a good roof. You know what you're getting into. And that work that you put in never goes to waste. Because even if you don't buy that one, you know, <laughs> or, or the next 75, <laughs> right. you, you are, you're going to eventually find something that you really like. And that's what happens with us too. Yeah. So that was like step two, because I'm kind of following along with these four steps. So understanding the business, it's perfectly. You just start with the things around you. What's your normal day look like? The products you're you're using, the the stuff you're consuming. So I mean, would okay. some good examples also be things that are like, you uh, you mentioned like a Chipotle burrito, but there's a lot of like brands that we almost just use as like the, the normal na noun for things like Kleenex, Band-Aid, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. Like those are brand names, but it just becomes so common that you call the actual thing by the brand name that to me, that seems like those are brands that aren't going anywhere. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. When, when you are naming the thing by the, not the generic name, but by the brand <laughs> name, those guys have gotten into your head mm -hmm. and, oh, yeah. uh, and they have obviously a really good product that, that they support so that you know that if you go, uh, to India and you want to get a soft drink, if you buy a Coke, you're going to get what you get other places in the world. Yep. You, know, you buy you buy the Punjabi cola, you may not get something you want. <laughs> sure. You might get something you don't want. <laughs> you know, Most likely. You know, nothing against Punjabi cola, <laughs> but the brand is something that lets you know you're going to have the same experience and that's worth a lot. And that means it more profitable. It's harder to compete with it. That makes perfect so, yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly right, man. So the uh, the third on the list, then we're uh, you know that's that's the part where we're talking about people, integrity, and talent. Would that kind yeah. of come from this research in your ten Ks and whatnot? It starts there, but you also have to look at um, what what are your own values here. Mm. What what do you think is really important in the world? And do the people who run this company agree with you? I'm I'm really into um, investing in what I mean, some people call it socially conscious investing, which has a sort of an edge to it because it, mm -hmm. it someone has decided what is socially conscious, right? <laughs> uh, That's true. So That's weird. I, I really prefer just that it's my values, whatever my values are, I should vote for with my money, right? Instead of just talking the talk, I'm going to walk the talk by putting my money into ownership positions in companies that I'd like to see in the world 20 years from now, because I think they're doing something good in the world. Mm. And that judgment about what's good in the world is very different from one person and another. Um, for example, I'm a huge fan of Whole Foods type grocery stores. Mm -hmm. I love what John Mackey, who's the founder, mm -hmm. has done to change our lives uh, for the better by you know gradually shifting us off of sort of the old school stuff and yep. into more natural more organic better quality everything and he's changing farming because of that so That's i right. love that guy's value set and and yet i also admire deeply 
my teacher, Warren Buffett, who <laughs> Buffett could care less about natural organic food. He owns <laughs> the biggest crap making company there is. Coca-Cola? Oh, Kraft. Kraft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He owns Kraft and he owns Coca-Cola, which <laughs> makes manufactures sugar water yeah. to the detriment of children everywhere. That's right. <laughs> I mean, right. So I'm, I'm spouting my values here. And this, I, I've listened to Buffett say this. This is basically like, hey, look, I like Coca-Cola. It makes me happy. <laughs> well, he goes like and it. has a, what, McDonald's every morning. <laughs> exactly. He's got a hamburger and he's got his McDonald's. He's got his Coke. And he said, look, I've been to Whole Foods. There's nobody smiling at Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> what, kale? No. <laughs> no. That's great. <laughs> Clearly has not been to Whole Foods up in, uh, what's the one? Um, just out of the city is Hills Hill, Hills uh, Hillcrest. Oh, Hillcrest Hill in San Diego. Yeah, yeah. He, he, now that is an awesome whole food. You know, we talked about another podcast about in that place. Well, yeah, Matt was about to say we actually just finished a recording with Tucker Max because uh, he was also at Speakeasy and he's out in Austin and he says he likes to go out to the Whole Foods in Austin every Saturday or Sunday and I'm like yeah no kidding because it's like a it's like a, a carnival there I mean there's it's an amusement park of food it's amazing the amusement think, park of food and beautiful women not that Tucker would ever be in <laughs> and beer and yeah whatever you want beer, beautiful women in beer not that Tucker would be in. that's right <laughs> I, I really like that guy he is an absolute hoot he's fun yeah he was a good interview so Anyway, yeah, the, so, the idea is that the CEO is the 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 lead cheerleader for a values of this company. Yeah, and so you want to look at the CEO and and try to see does this CEO share my values or is he doing something that's wrong in the world? And um, some of the things that I look for are um, it, do the CEOs are they paying themselves some obscene amount of money? Um, are they gaming the the system? It used to be 40 years ago that CEOs paid themselves rather well, even in the 80s, right? And they were mm -hmm. paying themselves 40 times the average uh, employee Jesus. salary, 40 times. Wow. And that was enough, right? But today it's 400 times. Jeez. They've wow. gamed the system so amazingly, you guys. Uh, honestly, it is a travesty. Wow. And the excuse that they have is, well, if I gave everybody back my entire $100 million salary, it would only amount to $10 per employee per year. Oh, so I deserve it anyway, $100 million a year. So it's he just justifies like, it. Yeah, justifies yeah, they it. just rationalize it. So I yeah. don't like putting money with people like that. I think they're a bunch of mercenaries, and I think they're capable. If they're that willing to ignore the fundamental qualities of leadership that I believe in, then I don't want anything to do with them. Mm -hmm. I think that a leader should lead. And I think that leadership means that you put your people first, man. You don't, mm. you don't pay yourself a hundred million and lay people off. Jeez, you put Jesus, your people horrible. first and you, you put your, your, everybody, everybody should be ahead in the line uh, before the CEO, right? Mm -hmm. if, and it's then funny, if everybody's it's, doing yeah. well, then he should do really well. I'm all for that. 100% agree. Matt and I were actually looking at some sites earlier and looking at the team structure. And, you know, you usually have the pictures of a team. And I absolutely love it when you see the CEO at the very bottom of that page, buried below everybody. Yes. That tells you something immediately what their values are like. It's exactly right. And I, I mean, I, I got my leadership training at the, the uh, infantry school at Fort Benning, Georgia, when I was a young uh, wanna, wannabe officer. And they teach you as a young lieutenant, what you're supposed to do is make sure your people eat first. You make sure they sleep first. You make sure that they're protected first. Mm -hmm. And then when the bullets start flying, you go first. Mm. And so those qualities of, of sort of uh, um, self, uh, selfless leadership are what I love to see in CEOs. And I see that in guys like Steve Jobs. I worked actually really pretty, pretty closely with Steve for a little while. Wow. And I mean, he was all about the mission, all yeah. about the mission, right? Yeah. yeah. And you see that with uh, with John Mackey, all about the mission. I mean, Mackey was paying himself a dollar a year. That's right. Okay? I remember Steve that. He worked for a dollar a year for a while. So I'm, I'm telling you, those are the guys I admire. And I think I wish we were turning out more people like that out of Harvard Business School, but I'm afraid it's going the other way. That would yeah. be nice. So is this is this just like a matter of looking up the company, finding out who the CEO is, and then like Googling the CEO's name and just kind of seeing what you can dig up on them? Is that the kind of research That's you it. go through? That's it. 
let's thank God for Google and the, and the fact that there's this enormous news core uh, in the business world trying to dig up any edge mm-hmm. um, that they can because they have so many people who are going to read it and devour it who are putting money on these news news bits. And so there's a lot of writing that's done on CEOs. You can often, they've even written a book by the time we hear about them. They have their, their own biography out there. Yep. Um, there's Wired 2.0 that one runs really good stories on CEOs. Fast Company does the same thing. Inc. Magazine. Um, there's just a ton of stuff where uh, if the CEO has been around a little while, somebody's gone out there and tried to dig up the dirt and find out who they really are. And the other thing that we do is there's a woman named Laura Rittenhouse, Laura Rittenhouse, mm-hmm. L.J. Rittenhouse, who wrote a book uh, called Reading Between the Lines that's really good. Mm. And it is, and Warren Buffett thinks it's a fabulous book. She, he said she's on the side of the angels once. Mm. And, um, <laughs> what she's done is teach us how to read the CEO letter to find out if they're lying to us. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's really cool. So the wow. CEO letter that's written every year to the shareholders is an opportunity for the CEO to talk to the owners um, and say, here's here's what the company did last year. Here's all the things you need to know to know what the value of the business is that you have invested in. That's what a CEO letter should do. It should be a complete mm. mea culpa, right? It should be, oh, yeah. here's what we did right, here's what we did wrong. Instead, a lot of these people m- make it a cheerleading section. Oh, we love our employees and everything is so great and we've done so well and and you know they just which is total bull crap it's yeah. a tough league out there and every company has problems every year and if, so laura's got a great book out there that you should read um awesome. to dig into ceo letters uh reading the 10k how you read the 10k to see if there's they're scamming you um and then read get, just google the heck out of the ceo Got it. And, yeah, uh, we'll you'll, link. you'll get the dirt if it's out there. <laughs> the dirt's the easiest part to find, typically. <laughs> exactly, it's there. <laughs> yeah, we'll link that bo- uh, that book in the uh, show notes for for the listeners here. Cool. And so, if we're going down the process, we have that fourth piece. Then buy it on sale. And, yeah, and know the worth we, of that. We thing. started talking about that already, right? Because yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I, here's the mistake most people make when they're out there trying to figure out what something's worth is that they're putting together discounted cash flow analysis in a sophisticated Excel spreadsheet and projecting into the future what the growth rates are going to be and what the earnings will be and what this and that is going to be. And at the end of the day, what the multiple will be that you should, pre- all of this <laughs> stuff, nothing wrong with it, except for one thing. And that is you tweak it a little bit one way or the other and the value of the business could change by 100%. Mm. So the, the, the thing that we do that I think is really smart is we just basically say, look, What's it producing in cash flow today that I can put in my pocket if I own the whole business? And then I'll pay 10 times that. And I'll do that only in the case that these other three boxes are checked. That is, it is something I understand. It's got a durable competitive advantage, which means it will be more productive in 10 years than it is today. It's not going to go away. And it's got a great CEO. Hmm. If it's got that lined up and I can buy it for 10 times the current owner earnings, I'll do that deal all day. You take action, you buy it. Yeah. Yeah, you buy it. You load up the truck. By the way, that's another little secret <laughs> um, is that we buy very aggressively. We don't do very much for most of the time. Like mo- mm-hmm. most of the time, we're not doing anything except just reading about stuff. But when we buy, we buy an enough a big enough chunk that it makes a real difference in our lives if that thing goes up. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense because you're front loading all that work. I mean, you're putting all that effort into sourcing the the few from just the masses of options out there. And then you're just going deep on that one once you find a winner. Yeah, it's a huge key to this whole thing to getting really extraordinary rates of return is that um, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger produced those kinds of enormous returns and became multi-billionaires um, by loading up the truck. They didn't do it by vast diversification. They they both have said uh, to me that about 15 companies were all that made the difference. Mm. And Warren said very explicitly once that we should all just have a punch card with 20 punches on it like you'd get at Subway. <laughs> and every time you buy a company, you punch the card and you only get 20 punches your entire life. Uh, I like so that. You will, when you're done punching, you can't buy any more companies. So you will definitely focus and take your time and be patient. So the, the first real real clue about how to get wealthy in investing in stocks is you're going to buy companies. 
and you're only going to buy a small number of them, which means when you get an opportunity to buy something wonderful that's on sale, you're going to load up the truck with that thing. You're not going to, if it's raining gold, you don't want to go outside with a thimble, right? You want to mm. go out with a wheelbarrow. Mm. And so this is a, this is a wonderful piece of gold right in front of you here. This, this thing that's worth $10 and it's, it's selling for five and you want to load up the truck with that. So we try to buy between five and 10 companies. And Got in order it. to do that, you have to spend a lot of time in cash. You can't constantly be in the market. You can't be chasing momentum. Oh, the market's going up. I've got to go get something. You can't just buy everything that's going up. You have to wait in cash. And that's why no fund managers do this. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of sideline. Yeah. Oh, man. You can't sit in cash <laughs> with a bunch of pension funds looking over your shoulder saying, what are you doing with my $50 million? You'll get fired. Yeah. You'll get fired. They're saying, swing. You're up at the plate with my money. You swing. Don't stand there. Love it. Now, when you Whereas say- I get to stand there. You and me, guys, the three of us, we can stand there and watch every pitch go by all day long for months and even years. I, I've stood there watching every, every pitch means the market's throwing an idea at you, right? Mm-hmm. Here, buy Microsoft for this. Here, buy Facebook for that. I can look at all those go by because, and just say, no, not my pitch, not my pitch. Waiting for this one pitch I know I can hit. I've already identified what it is. I know exactly what it looks like. And when finally they throw the thing up to me at a price I want to pay, <laughs> I'm ready and I can hit it. Yeah. You're not tired and swinging at every single option out. No. Yeah, it's coming to your no, You're ready. You're ready. That makes sense. Now, when you say the, uh, the the cash flow to the owners and you're willing to pay 10 times that, is that referring to to the, the dividends that it pays out? I mean, how do, how do you find that? Well, in a well-run company, dividends are part of the owner cash. Um, a, a really good company only pays dividends out of cash that it doesn't need to continue to grow and operate its business. And um, this owner cash, this stuff you can put in your money, in your pocket if you own the whole business, um, this owner cash from a good company is a really um, easy way to set up the valuation of the business. So you're looking at, all right, I've got I've got $50,000 coming out of this business, whatever it is, a, let's say a laundromat, right? Mm-hmm. So you got this laundromat and it's producing revenue of $200,000 a year. And after you pay for everything, including replacing machines and all your employees and the whole deal, um, what you're getting is $50,000 a year. And, and that sets a value for that business. And it's, Hmm. that's as simple as it gets. It sets a value for the business. And once you have that value set, you don't really worry too much about, you know, what, What's it going to be in the long run? Because you know people are going to still be, you know, using laundromats down the road. Yeah. What you do is you buy that thing when it's got this great cash flow, and the cash flow is ten percent yield on uh, on the price you paid for the business. Got it. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Now, and something else regarding cash in a different way is uh, in San Diego, and we we're talking about the current economy. Uh, you were saying you're basically loading up on cash right now for the future. And I believe you said it's kind of posing itself to correct pretty soon here, right? The economy as a whole. Yeah. Well, here's the thing we, that we know. We don't have a crystal ball, right? right. Nobody nobody has one of those. And, and and what we do know, though, is that periodically in, a, in our society, the economy gets too overheated and then it, it starts to contract. People start to say, well, I've got too much credit. I'm not going to borrow any more money. Or the bank says, you've got too much credit. I'm not going to lend you any more money. You have to start paying off your loans. And that's the end of what's called the credit cycle, right? And then from that typically comes a recession for a little while. You have a time when there's not as much sales going on. The shops aren't aren't doing as well. And um, that cycle is very regular. It happens every seven to 10 years in America. And it's happened that way for 140 years. And there's nothing that can stop that cycle from happening short of massive government intervention, which we seem to be having right now. Yeah. So right now we're entering our 10th year without a recession. And um, the government is starting to be kind of nervous that it's too involved and it's starting to pull back by um, raising interest rates, starting to try to maybe slow things down a little bit. Maybe things are going too overheated. Housing prices are back up where they were at the peak of 2007 Mm. before they crashed. The stock market is making new records all the time. Um, And so 
with this going on, it's almost inevitable that we're going to have an economic storm. And when it starts, all of these wonderful businesses we want to buy are going to go on sale. Right. Because people start pulling their money out and that causes prices to go down, right? Yep. So when they go on sale, we want to be there. And right now we're at our 10th year. And I mean, you guys can draw your own conclusions about where we should, where, what we should have happen here. But Warren Buffett has got his conclusion and that is <clears throat> that he is $110 billion in cash. Oh my God. $110 billion. And the reason he's in $110 billion in cash is as much as he would desperately like to own more stuff, he can't find anything that's on sale right now. Right. And that's what's happened to me is that it's, it's a little bit non-intuitive, but it's not so much that I'm pulling out of the market as I'm taking the profits from the companies that I owned um, and that have gone up dramatically since 2009, we're going to take those profits off the table and sit in cash from those things because they're not going to go up much more probably. Mm -hmm. At least they shouldn't. They're already way overpriced. And then we'll hold on to the ones that we still bought on sale. But in general, we're starting to go to cash because there's n there's nothing there that I can buy. Right. I can't find great companies that are on sale. <clears throat> and whenever that's happened in the past, we're getting within you know 24 months or so of a big crash. Got and it. so we're, we're starting to set up for it. Makes sense. So I guess the, yeah, obviously listeners <laughs> draw your own conclusion, but um, <laughs> definitely it sounds like, you know, have some cash in hand, focus on that. And, uh, and keep an eye out for how the market's looking, but also these opportunities. Maybe there are a handful that you'd really like to get in or, uh, you know, but just kind of do your homework, it sounds like. Um, Man, and, and if yeah. all you did was just go to cash ahead of this crash, right? And then even without knowing anything about companies, if you just um, said, okay, what are the best companies I know about? You just pick those. After the crash has happened, a year from, let's say it crashes tomorrow, a year from now, the market will finally be down really low. And you can go and you say, okay, well, clearly Apple Computer, that's a great company. I'll buy that one. Um, let's see. I'll buy General Motors. That's a really good car mm -hmm. company. Um, you might take a chance on Tesla because you really like it. And it's, you know, it's gotten its stock price cut by 75% because of the recession. Right. Um, and you just start picking up these companies you like. And yeah. you get maybe 10 of them and buy them cheap. And I'm telling you, leave them there. We Remember I told you guys we did our first workshop in Singapore yep, yep. back in 2009? Well, I had the students create a list of companies. Now, this happened to be right a, you know, after the stock market crash and the stock market's just starting to come back up. And I'm now very aggressively buying companies. Okay, So I start teaching these students. Um, and I said, you guys find 10 companies you really like. And so they laid out a list of these companies. And did a paper portfolio as if they had a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars and they bought those companies and today those 10 companies total are worth six hundred and fifty thousand oh, dollars those six okay in the last 10 years so 100 went to 200 that's one double 200 went to 400 that's two doubles and a half of another one and that's in a 10-year period of time so that means they're compounding their money at about 22 percent per year right and I guess that's Just something like, we haven't even talked about is compound interest and compound earnings and all oh that. Oh, my God. You guys <laughs> know how powerful that is yeah. to be compounding money at a high rate of return. So really, because compounding is so powerful, if you're young enough, like you guys are young, mm -hmm. you, you start early enough with this. I swear to God, it doesn't matter how much money you start with. You can start with $1,000 and you will be almost as rich as somebody that starts today with 100000 mm. Mm. Both of you doing exactly the same kind of investing because it's not going to take you that long to catch up um, with the person that's got a hundred, right? Yeah. You're doing the same kind of investing and you, eventually that doesn't matter that you had a lower starting point very much. Your lives will be very similar. You're going to have more money than you know what to do with. Sure. Which not a bad place nice. to be in. I like the sound of that. <laughs> not it's a bad, yeah. I'm All my money right now guys. I know what to do with and I want, I want not know what to do with money. <laughs> exactly. You want to not know. I, I will tell you from my personal experience that when I had my first million dollars, um, I was only a couple years removed from living entirely out of a waterproof bag wow. about you know a foot high and, a, and 18 inches wide. Everything I owned had been in that bag. So I'm, I'm st I was still in that sort of you know comfort zone where I didn't need a lot. 
and now I had a million dollars. I didn't think there was any way I could spend a million dollars the rest of my life, but I found out I was wrong. Yeah. Well, actually, you brought up a point because I know a lot of folks just even getting into the market, even though you know these are freaking proven principles right here by many, many people, there's still that emotional belief thing happening in everyone's head, head trash, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. Are there some things that you've seen people, um, you know, good ways to get past that? Uh, you know, the doubt, oh, I've lost money before, uh, but ways to move past that. Yeah. In fact, it's the fear of investing that kept my own daughter from ever in being interested in it. Oh, wow. And um, she said, Dad, maybe what we should do. Well, she finally got to this place where she is an attorney in Boulder, Colorado and making decent money. And she started adding it all up what you know how much she should could save and how long it would take her to work as an attorney before she got to a place where she didn't feel like you know she was she where she felt like she was financially free and she found out basically she's going to be a, a wage slave her entire life mm. and so she finally came to her old man <laughs> and i had been trying to teach her to invest for years but she didn't wasn't interested in yep she said let's do a podcast and you teach me during the podcast to invest and then i'll have to do it because i'm on a podcast and <laughs> people it. are listening and so we started that and that ended up being really popular we're still doing it it's called invested and we wrote a book based on the podcast we said okay look let's have a danielle you take a year and we're going to do this a month at a time i'm going to teach you something new every month for a year and i want you to go from never having invested to investing successfully and she accomplished that and the book is about that journey and it starts off in the first chapter about the fear she has about investing on her own and it, and most people if they're halfway um self-aware know that they don't know what they're doing when it comes to investing mm -hmm. and they're afraid that it's as actually as difficult as what all the financial advisors make it out to be and you know, they don't have an mba they don't have all this background and therefore they're very concerned that they won't be able to invest properly. And I'll tell you, if you're afraid like that, this book is perfect because it walks walks you through how Danielle dealt with those fears um, by gradually becoming more and more comfortable about the nature of the investment process. And yeah. it really is a good book. And I, I'm going to, I'm going to recommend it to you strongly. It was, the, as you guys said, it was the number one nonfiction book in America in April. And, <laughs> and it's a, uh, it's a good book, man. I, I love it. Yeah. And I know, you, I know you mentioned her and I saw that you had a podcast. I didn't know that was the actual format or the kind of the mission or purpose behind it. But now because of that, I think everyone should probably go over there and start from day one. It sounds like. Oh no, I love, I love the concept of the podcast too, because it's like your, your daughter's the voice of the listeners and you're the, you know, you're the seasoned pro that's guiding her through it and you anybody could be a fly on the wall to see what exact advice you would give to your own daughter i think that's an amazing concept and and she has this really nasty way of digging in on me when i haven't been <laughs> as clear as i should have been yeah <laughs> she, she's she does it like a lawyer you know just oh. taking me apart and it it it, it creates, a, I think, a fairly interesting dynamic. She's completely <laughs> unintimidated by me whatsoever. Yeah. And I say things that I think are self-evident, and yeah. she spends the next 40 minutes ripping them apart. <laughs> and what the result of that is, is that the clarity that comes out of the podcast is really important for people who are listening to the podcast. And so many people have come up to us later at a workshop that we're doing and said, look, um, you know, like, like a 40-year-old construction guy came up and said, Hey, I'm Danielle. <laughs> I'm I'm your daughter, man. Everything she asks you is the stuff I keep thinking, and and nobody asks these questions. So it's a uh, it's 165 podcasts so far. Wow, um, we've done a lot of them, and and so it's a bit of a of a pile to to make your way through. But it's a great education, awesome. especially if you're starting with a lot of fear about doing this at all. So with with yeah. the podcast, do you recommend just going all the way to episode one and just starting there and and working yeah. your way through them? Yeah, I'd start right there. Perfect. And you're, you're going to hear almost straight off the bat with episode one, you're going to hear the fear. You're going to hear the, 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 the overarching and compelling complaint that this is stupid and I don't want to do it. That's really where she... <laughs> <laughs> this is why I want to listen to it. I don't want to do it. And then we get into the basics. It's so basic, but it's a lot of basics people don't have, you know? Yeah. She, for example, Danielle thought, she could just save money and it would be okay. 
She mm. didn't know about inflation. She didn't know that inflation would eat up all of her savings over the course of her life at, at even the minor rate that we have, which is just 3%. And, um, and the discovery that her, her investing would have to keep up with the rate of inflation or she was going backwards on every dollar she saved. Yeah. That was a revelation and a shock to her. Um, and so those are, those are the places we start. So if you're out there and you're That's thinking, great. man, I don't know anything about this. It's a good place to go. And because I just think of people, I mean, we have Matt and I talk about our friends often. A lot of them actually listen to the show. So hopefully this does resonate, but they almost feel like they're not in control, uh, not in control of making a better life, breaking out of this system of, you know, school, college and day job until the day I retire. And then, you know, that's when I actually live life. Uh, where this is an opportunity to get out, like you said, even a thousand dollars, stash it away for a couple months. If you, you know, anyone can do that and then apply that in the right way. So I hope and that's the a, case. Yeah. Oh, that is the case. There's a guy who's a dentist at, that went to USC uh, dental school and then to a residency at USC. So he spent seven years working to build up his career as an orthodontic surgeon. And now he's out of dental school. And the loans that he got at USC have compounded at eight percent per year, oh, man. faster than he can pay them off. Wow! And as a result, he now owns a owes one million dollars. Jeez! That's going up at the rate of eighty five thousand dollars a year. Dear God! <laughs> he only makes two hundred and twenty five thousand a year, so it's going to go to two million by I think twenty thirty. He'll owe two million dollars. I mean, there are so many people out there who are up against this out of control feeling as a result of school loans, as a result of, of, you know, being afraid of what, being afraid of going into a, a job just solely to make money right? And, and wanting to have a life, you know? And that's and the yet, thing, yeah. Yeah, and yet you get stuck going into a job you hate because you gotta pay a loan. I mean, it really does feel like you're out of control, you know? And yeah. I, guys, I, was, I avoided that somehow by, a, a totally different train wreck. You know, I, I went, I'm, I'm older here, right? So I can give you some grandfatherly Please. advice. Yeah, yeah. I, I, went to, I went to Vietnam and when I came back, I was a lost puppy, man. I had PTSD like crazy and mm. I ended up as a guide in the Grand Canyon and that's what sort of helped me get through. Plus I learned to meditate, which really helped me get through. We talked about that. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I really think that's an important one. Um, but the thing is, it, I had one thing going for me and that was that I knew how to live on not much. And I didn't owe anybody any money. And so I was actually having a reasonably decent life, making $4,000 a year working in the Grand Canyon. Hmm. I was saving enough money to go to India. Oh, and that's where you're going. over in India, right? I didn't need much. And, and it's a little bit that, uh, that idea that if, if you don't need a lot, um, the world's kind of your oyster. You can you can take or leave it, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need a lot. What happens to us is we start stacking it up with the kind of car we want to drive, mm -hmm. the kind of house we want to live in, the neighborhood we want to be in, trying to keep up with our friends who are making a million a year. And all of this stuff starts to put so much pressure on us that we don't have an opportunity to find out what's our dharma. What am I here for? Mm. And And so if there's a good reason to be an investor, whether it's something you're comfortable doing or not perhaps the best reason of all if i could go teach that dentist how to take a few thousand dollars a year and he could end up covering those loans sure it's, it's yeah. just a matter of getting a higher rate of return doing what i do and um and so the beauty of investing is that it frees you hmm. it gives you financial freedom not that you're rich but that you know you'll be okay mm -hmm. yeah, I love that. that's enough right there to change the whole direction of your life Love it. Love it. Now, I've got a couple small rabbit holes I want to go down real quick. I don't think these will be super in-depth topics, but I just want to touch on them real quick and get your thoughts on them. Um, so one, we've had past guests, actually multiple, probably four or five past guests, where we've talked about cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and you know that kind of stuff. And I was just curious what your sort of thoughts, what your take on it is, just you know, just generally, what do you what do you think about that? And, you know, do you have any predictions on what that could do to the economy and, um, and investments in general? Well, I think that there's a real place for it, actually. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not talking about just the blockchain technology, which everybody thinks there's a real place for I'm talking about the actual currency. Um, I think there'll be a winner and maybe it'll be Bitcoin, mm -hmm. or maybe it'll be Ethereum. I don't know. But 
I think there's a place for it. Um, if you like the idea of having something that's beyond government reach, at least theoretically beyond government reach, mm -hmm. that can't be inflated, that can't be destroyed as a currency, um, as a storehouse of value and anonymity. Um, because obviously the world's a really dangerous place and we've been very fortunate to be um, in a country where we don't deal with uh, the kind of violence that goes on in lots of other parts of the world. But mm -hmm. can you imagine if you lived in Venezuela and you saved up your whole life and, um, and then the, a government comes along that destroys the value of your currency mm -hmm. to where all of your savings in your Venezuelan dollars are worthless. I, I mean, it all goes away. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's so, that's so hard to deal with. That's happened in Argentina twice in my lifetime wow. where they've destroyed the currency intentionally twice. Um, and Venezuela now, and I've, I've been in countries when I was in the army where they have, they have gone through this hyperinflation. And I'll tell you what, man, it, it ain't a pretty thing. The world gets on fire and people get hurt. Mm. And having a storehouse of value that's beyond governments where they can't, they can't lock you up at the border. You're not trying to, you know, like tape money onto your body. Right. Um, I, I was in one country where I was trading U.S. dollars for gold um, as they were undergoing a revolution. And it is, wow. um, it is a scary thing, man. I'm telling you right now, the average person is no way equipped for the kind of danger that that kind of money transfer would entail mm -hmm. if a government's trying to keep you from getting your money out of that country. And yeah. so there's a real place there for those of us who are slightly skeptical about the uh, I guess the altruistic nature of government, you know, just yeah. not that sure, yeah. not that sure government is really not in it for itself as opposed to being in it for the people. Sure. And I would like that. I would love to see a version of, of, uh, of Bitcoin become something that stabilizes and, and is, and is a stable storehouse of value. And obviously we're at a very beginning stages here. Nobody knows who the winner is going to be. So it's really hard to say that we can invest in it, but I think we can trade it. And mm -hmm. I've got a very good friend of mine who's made ballpark about 40 or $50 million trading Bitcoin mm -hmm. and Ethereum and Ripple. And they, and he's just really good at it. And he could give it all back tomorrow because he's just, you know, all in. Yeah. But, um, but I would say right now it's a trading, it's a trading event. And of course it's going on the, the uh, Chicago board of exchange is going to start trading it, yep. uh, trading futures. I, I think it's a worthy thing. And, um, and I love the idea of it being outside of government. Yeah. I would like to know more about it that, that would tell me that governments can't somehow get you anyway. Yeah. Um, because, I mean, think about 1933 in America when we were going through depression and, um, and people were starting to not want to spend money because uh, they were scared about what would happen to their job. And so they started storing money in that age's equivalent of Bitcoin, which is gold. Mm -hmm right? It's anonymous. It doesn't move across borders very well, but if you can get it across a border, it's just accepted at the other side. Right. And so people started storing money, turning dollars into gold. And the federal government of the United States made that illegal mm. in 1933. Yeah. And they confiscated all the gold in America, bought it from people. They didn't take it for nothing. They paid them $20 per ounce. Hmm. And once they had all the gold, then they arbitrarily moved the exchange rate on gold up by almost double. So effectively what the government did was say that, yeah, the real value of gold is $40 an ounce. We're going to pay you 20 because you don't have any choice and we're going to take it. So they confiscated at a half price. And I think that it's going to, I would like to know that Bitcoin couldn't have that done to it. And I think that's probably the, what it's all about is that it can't have that done to it. Right. So honestly, uh, uh, I think, Bitcoin right now, trade it um, and look for the winner. And when there's a winner and it stabilizes, then I would say some money in it would be a good idea. I love it. That makes a lot of sense. And then there, one other little quick topic I wanted to touch on. So I'm on I'm on this mailing list of, of someone named James Altucher. You may be familiar with him, um, but he, he's got a newsletter that actually gives investing advice. And lately, his big thing that he's been pushing in, in his newsletter is that the next hot thing, the next like gold rush is the, the cannabis marijuana related stocks. And I was just mm -hmm. curious if I could get your quick take on that as well. I, I think he's right that there's going to be a huge winner in that area. 
Um, obviously, I think the whole country is going to legalize. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it, one of the ways we solve the problem at the, at the border is we we uh, legalize these drugs that are funding the narcos in Mexico and making Mexico so dangerous that people right. have to leave terrified for their life. And it's one of the reasons, you know, our friends are so afraid of a wall is that their families can't get out if there's a wall. That's right. And so um, uh, I'm really into finding a solution uh, to the narco problem. And we've already started down that road in America by legalizing in some of the states. So somebody's going to be a big winner in this thing. And the, the catch, of course, when you're in an early stage like this is figuring out who that is. Um, there's a there's a funny thing about airlines that Warren Buffett used to say um, that that somebody should somebody should sort of lock him up the next time he wants to invest in an airline. <laughs> he said even better than that is to time travel back to Kitty Hawk and kill the Wright brothers. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! <laughs> because so many of these companies have come out of there and failed, right? And even though they look like they're great for a time, they end up going bankrupt. Same thing with the car companies. I think there were literally about a thousand companies trying to be the, the automobile manufacturers and it boiled down to GM and Chrysler and Ford ultimately and the rest of them are bones in the, in the car yard. Right. And, um, and we don't wanna be bones in the car yard we, as an investor. So when it comes time to look at uh, a marijuana manufacturing company, um, I would take a serious look at companies that make tools for that, right? Right. Mm-hmm. You know, don't don't be the mi- don't bet on the miner, bet on the on the shovel guy. Right. Yep. And and, um, and especially if they've used if they are selling those tools to other industries where you've got yourself uh, diversified a little bit. Um, but in general, you'd want to trade those. I put those kind of deals into what I call my risky business portfolio, which is about ten percent of my overall portfolio. I use for fun to take a shot, right? Mm-hmm. So. You do your research and you find out, all right, do I understand this business that these guys are in with with uh, manufacturing and distributing marijuana? Do I understand the risk of the business? Do I understand what gives them a durable protective advantage against other companies? How how come Phil Town just can't come in and start up a marijuana company <laughs> right, right next door? What What's preventing me from doing that right. is a moat, right? So are, do these guys have a moat? Is there such a thing as a moat? in this business. And if there isn't, then I'd be very careful. I would trade them, but I wouldn't try to be a long-term owner. I only want to be a long-term owner of things that are very durable, have proven that durability for at least eight to 10 years. And I can see really clearly into the future that nobody can knock them out of the seat. And right now I don't feel that way about those guys. I love it. Yeah. I was actually watching a documentary, I think on HBO or something like that. And the person so far, I think, well, legally the person so far who's made like the most money in the medical or the marijuana industry has actually been a guy who sells i believe manure some sort of like manure okay. or some sort of soil that it grows in really well it was something like that is the person who's actually become the wealthiest so far in the legal marijuana trade obviously you know you've got cartels and stuff that probably you know make the amount of money he made <laughs> look like pennies but uh as far as the legal marijuana trade it's actually this guy that's selling like manure and topsoils <laughs> wow i uh, now you're now that's see that's thinking like an investor right that's a second level of thinking and um that's really really smart and you're going to find that there are these guys who are producing something that turns out to be patented or trade secreted and they've got control of a significant portion of that market. And as a result, they can charge a premium for the product. They're more profitable, very difficult to compete with this uh, with this product. And they become the Xerox of marijuana. They become the Coca-Cola of marijuana, right? Mm-hmm. And that's who you want to buy on. That's, those are the guys you want to own. Makes perfect sense. All right, man, I feel, I feel like we can keep going forever. We might have to do a round two. <laughs> so much <laughs> fun, <yes>. <laughs> <laughs> We love this stuff, and you're great it's, at it. The world, the world opens up so much when you start to look at companies and, and, and think about voting your money and putting your money where your mouth is. You know, if you, if you love the whole idea of, of uh, marijuana and the growers and you start looking, that's exactly what investing is all about. You just, you just start digging in because it's fun and you like it. Hmm. And you, you realize, okay, now – what are the rules that I need to follow? Those were laid down by the grandfathers, Buffett and Munger. Mm-hmm. Follow those rules. We lay them out really good for you in the book, Invested. And you're gonna be a, you, you'll have so much fun.
fun, even if you're just digging in on the beginning of the marijuana industry. That's the thing. You're going to learn so much, even if you're not investing. But might as well invest and make some money off (laughs) this bad boy, huh? (laughs) Yeah, you're going to learn, you know, Panama red or Mexico green or what? (laughs) What? Seems like you know quite a bit. (laughs) We won't go there. (laughs) All right, Phil. Well, definitely everyone, uh, you know, the folks listening, get invested. I know I'm going to go get that now. I've heard quite a bit about it right before this as well. And also you mentioned uh, L.J. Rittenhouse, correct? Is that her name? L.J. Rittenhouse, uh, Reading Between the Lines. Reading Between the Lines, yeah. So we'll link that up in the show notes. Now, are there any other uh, must-read books for people that want to sort of dive into this world a little deeper um, outside of your, you know, your, your books and this Reading Between the Lines? Because we'll, oh, we'll link all some, those up in the show notes, but I'm curious if there's any yeah, like put, must put read. Put a couple of these books in the show notes. I just think they're so valuable. Um, the first one is um, The Education of a Value Investor. Mm-hmm. Education of a Value Investor by Guy Spear, who is um, one of the best investors on the planet and is fabulous and uh, and a great guy. And it it's his journey from being basically a Wall Street asshole to becoming an absolute uh, disciple of Warren Buffett and value investing. It's fabulous, and you'll learn so much. Mm. And the second one is written by Monesh Prabrai, P-A-B-R-A-I, and it's called The Dondo Investor, or mm-hmm. Dondo Investing, D-H-A-N-D-O, Dondo, mm-hmm. which is, I think it's Hindi for business investing. Mm. And by that, he means buy businesses, not just shares of stock, buy companies that you understand. And he's a devotee of Buffett as well, and one of the best investors in the world. He invests all over the world, uh, Indian national guy, and he mm-hmm. lives up in Irvine, fantastic man. And um, anything you can get by him is great. So Dondo Investing and The Education of a Value Investor are two of the best books ever written about this kind of investing. We're grabbing them. That's for sure. And uh, definitely, where do we want to point people to check out more of your stuff? So I know we we talked about uh, the event, but you have the podcast and all that as well. Yeah, and we'll do something for your listeners. We'll we'll give you guys... uh, um, they can come onto the website at ruleoneinvesting.com and they can get a scholarship. They just apply for a scholarship. We'll make sure they get there. Tell them you, you know, tell us you were on the listening to podcast. You're fan, fans of, uh, mm-hmm. of Joe and Matt, and um, we'll get you a, a full ride scholarship to our three day workshops. Uh, we don't sell anything there. We 100% educate you. And, um, and we'll make that sure that, you know, you got to pay to get out there and stay, but uh, we do those in Atlanta and once a year we do them in San Diego. Oh, man. Okay, Matt, we got to figure out a way to go to that. <laughs> got to figure out a way to go. We're here. <laughs> We're in, no, in June. Yeah, the one coming up here. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> so. exactly. Awesome, yeah, I would love Phil. to have you. You guys, are, you guys are VIPs, man. We'll put you right there. I love appreciate that. Awesome. All right, yeah, Phil. Well, we'll probably do a round two in the future once we get our feet wet a little bit more, too. And Looking uh, forward to it already. You guys are great. Thanks for your time, man. See ya. All right, bye. All right. Thank you. And I hope you just enjoyed this episode you just listened to. Now, right now, before we sign off, I have a few things I would love for you to do. So the very first thing is to go find our guest on Facebook and tell them that you loved their episode with us. That's going to help them uh, just feel good about themselves, but also uh, it's going to spread the word a little bit more for us. So go find them on Facebook. Everybody's on Facebook and go say that you love their episode and maybe one cool thing that you learned there. The second thing is to go to iTunes and subscribe to our podcast. Just look up Hustle and Flow Chart and hit the subscribe button. And the very last thing, the third thing is to leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you're listening to this podcast and help us spread the word more. That's how more people are going to get uh, this awesome knowledge, this, this cool podcast training and a whole bunch of other cool free training that we give out at evergreenprofits.com. So that's about it. Go find them on Facebook, go subscribe on iTunes and leave us a review. You would be amazing if you did that, but you're always amazing. So thanks for listening and we'll catch you in the next episode.